So I want to talk about basic properties we get out of transistors. These will feel like I'm looking at differential pairs, differential pair types of circuits. So I'm looking at just only a couple transistors. But what's going to be interesting is when we talk about differential pairs, we have very nonlinear dynamics and very nonlinear properties. And yet, in a certain way, we can still get some linear properties out of, out of what's going on here. And that may be a bit of a surprise as you begin to look at certain types of circuits. If you take a look at a differential pair, right, it turns out that one way to think about this is as a current divider. And this is quite an interesting, interesting process and approach. Is you might say, well, imagine I have two voltages, V1 and V2, that I'm keeping fixed. Normally, we talk about differential pair of having inputs on V1 and V2 and um, having a fixed bias current. And then we look at what, how that changes for I1 and I2. Fair, that is a very important perspective and relevant in these conversations. But let's think about it a little differently. Imagine I keep V1 and V2 fixed, and my input current is I in, and I want to know how does that split how I1 and I2 look? How does it divide the current? We're going to look at things in saturation, and particularly in subthreshold. And an interesting thing happens on the way there. When you look at you, I got a, you have a source voltage here at this node, and something very interesting happens along the way. I can write the current for I1 as this expression, write the current for I2 as this expression having both V2 and Vs, sort of lumping a lot of the other constants into I0 into the front. And I do this partially because it becomes pretty easy just to go, well, let me just take all of this piece and lump that into one constant, which I'm going to just call W1. Obviously, that has in this particular form. It's not just night. It's not an abstracted weight. It's a current, but we'll go with that. And then it has an exponential function of that source voltage, this middle node here, over U T. Interestingly enough, for I two, I get something that's that W two, again time related to that middle middle node V S. Interesting thing happens. Divide I one and I two. What do I get? Well, that turns out to be W1 over W2. The Vs's cancel out. Now, if you look through basic differential equation, differential pair, and understand these, this is not surprising until you think about it for a moment. You're like, wait, the ratio is fixed. And even more interesting than you go, well, I can now substitute values back. Assuming these two transistors were matched, all the I0 things would disappear. This is then just going to be an exponential of V1 minus V2. And you think, well, that's kind of interesting. So it's a very clear, controllable ratio of the ratio of I1 to I2. And actually quite a bit of dynamic range, quite a bit of range on that, too. And quite a bit of tunability. And you think, well, that's kind of a neat sort of theoretical conversation, but you know, it doesn't really do much more until you say, well, all right, let's take another structure. And this is sort of eventually what starts to get talked about as a diffuser. Uh, is something that allows you to do diffusion through these structures. Now, that name originally came from Kobena Bowen, who figured out how to think about these kinds of circuits. Um, and so kind of kind of use that notation. Uh, some people call them pseudoresistors. There's some history to that as well. It's all, all of this is very tightly interrelated. But you might look at a case of going, I have now two input currents, I1 and I2, not just a single one. I still have two output currents, I01 and I02. I have two source nodes, v, VS1 and VS2. And now I could actually say, well, how do I write this? Well, I certainly can get the first one, I0, this one's not going to be related to having a weight. This feels exactly like what we do for V1. The same thing would be true on the on the other side, but it has a different Vs, so I, but the same weighting term. So again, very similar to what we're doing here, but now playing off this node. But notice then I have this transistor in the middle. And you're going to think, well, that's just going to mess this up. But it turns out this device, now I'm going to not treat it in saturation, but I'm going to be thinking about it in the, you know, sort of more the generic case. So looking at more of its ohmic behavior.
And in that case, I'm going to have to deal with the source voltage here, Vs1, minus what I have at Vs2, but I'm still going to have sort of a waiting term, W2. Very similar, it's going to have the same sort of thing of having this sort of I0 EXP kappa V2 over UT. Same idea. And you think, huh, well this is interesting, where's she going with this? Well, what you notice as soon as you see that is that this exponential for the first one is, this, is the same as I get up here. And the second one is the same I get over here. So I actually could reduce this down and say that that current going IA going in this direction is now W2 over W1 times the difference of those two output currents. And that's kind of interesting because notice this is a linear expression. I can also write linear current expressions at this node for I, I0, 1 and I1 and IA and the same thing for I0, 2, I2 and IA. Okay, this you think wait this is entirely linear and then you can actually reduce down for IA uh, for W2 over W1. Notice that you know, we get the same sort of issues over here for W1 and W2. And I can then kind of build a whole structure there. Oh, this is cool. This allows me to talk about a number of different properties. Um, and again, I could say what's the ratio W2 to W1 is related to, you know, E to the V2 minus V1. Same sort of concepts that we've seen before. And in fact, I can even look at very specific cases where I go, well, imagine I have very weak coupling. So, you know, V2 is not, not very high compared to V1. So that makes us look like there isn't much current that's going to want to flow through here. And in fact, analytically, that's what you find is IA is kind of small. Um, really deal with W2 over W1. The other thing I get is that, you know, these currents basically are the same all the way through. Because basically, this is not allowing a lot of current to come through here in either direction. So no surprise. On the other hand, imagine if I make V2 very large compared to the V1 cases, that almost looks like I shorted these two points together. I have a very strong coupling. And so that means that these two currents are going to be equal because after all, it looks like if this is shorted, this looks like a differential pair when these two inputs are the same. So I'd expect that, that the output currents are identical. And so I get a very interesting case there and I find that IA is basically the current that I need to go between these two nodes to make everything equal. Now we could continue through these and, the, and there are many different kinds of interesting examples but what's really important here to notice is that I'm getting linear behavior for current operations that looks a lot like resistors but it's with tunable transistors and so I can still have the tunability all the way through and transistors that can be done on ship versus resistors which are quite painful to do. And this whole thing can extend out to much, much larger networks, particularly if I want to do things like sort of spatial coupling or spatial interactions or spatial filtering. This opens up a whole range of things that just very naturally fit on a typical, on typical silicon circuits. So this concept is very, very important to kind of realize the kind of linear behaviors, at least in some domains, that I could get uh, even with nonlinear elements.